So tonight's our second class, our second week uh, in our equipping Healer, um, the Miracles of Jesus. And tonight we're going to talk about Jesus who brings spiritual sight, um, physical sight to a blind man, but spiritual sight to a blind world. And like we said last week, and we're going to continue to say that, that healing, it's really a two-part focus. The first part is addressing the spiritual need of the people. The second part is if there's a, there's a physical need to address that. Uh, we, you know, I shared last week that, that a lot of times when we minister healing, uh, someone comes up to the altar, wherever we encounter them, and we're so quick to jump into that, we're going we're gonna to get rid of that bunion on your toe. But we forget to, we forget to address the spiritual needs of the people. Um, their, their salvation is, is a lot longer and a lot more important. It's eternity than the bunion on their toe. So when we minister healing to people, let's remember that, that first, the most important ministry is to their, to their spiritual well-being. And so tonight we're going to go to John, uh, we're going to go through John 1, uh, 9, 1 through 41. We're not going to go through the whole scripture, but I do encourage you to read that. Uh, it's John 9, 1 through 41. Read the story, the complete story. It's when Jesus heals a blind man uh, who was actually born blind. And, and so it's really interesting. That, um, it's not in the context of tonight's class, but, but I want you to read that through the week and really see the different characters that, that come through this encounter with Jesus. And I also challenge you to be vulnerable enough and open enough to, to see which character maybe you, you identify with. There's a lot of different interactions in this. And, um, and I thought it was really telling. But what I want to do is I want to focus on the, on the act of spiritual healing and physical healing because, you know, as believers, we are called. We are called to be known by our healing ministries. It is an opportunity to shine God's light to a dark and decaying world. And so, you know, the first thing when I tell people that, they're like, well, I don't have the gift of healing. I don't have the gift of healing. Well, let me tell you something. Uh, Jesus says you do. Amen. Jesus says you do. What I will share again, we're going to go back to, we're going to go back to the, uh, the Great Commission through Mark 16, 14 through 18. And I'll read it to you. It's up there. It says, later he appeared to the eleven as they sat at the table. Now, what do we notice? There's only eleven. We know what happened to the other one. And he rebuked their unbelief and hardness of heart because they did not believe those who had seen him after he had risen. So what I want to share is just a moment the Holy Spirit had put on my heart as I was praying today for this was, I just want to ask you, are there areas of, of unbelief and maybe hard hardness in your life? I mean, Jesus has been resurrected. Jesus has returned. We see the evidence of God, the Trinity, in our daily lives through the Holy Spirit that indwells us, through God's eternal word. So Jesus is with us. And so when he rebukes the 11, of course it's easy because he's there. But I want to challenge you, are there areas in your life where maybe there's become hard-heartedness or maybe unbelief? So when Jesus rebukes, it's never for condemnation. It's for, it's for encouragement, for correction. Uh, for us to move into a posture of healing the way Jesus healed, we've really got to continue. We talk about crucifying our flesh daily. And I think sometimes we, we're like, ah, no, that takes sacrifice. <laughs> but that's important. It's important to understand that we've consistently got to be in a state as believers to move from, from glory to glory through the process of sanctification, getting better as believers, maturing, is that we're always willing to, to, uh, to circumcise the callousness on our hearts, circumcise the things of the flesh that are keeping us from God. And so we continue, it says, because they did not believe those who had seen him after he had risen. And he said to them, go into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. Go, apostale, sent, and preach the word, the gospel, to every creature. And he who believes and is baptized will be saved, but he who does not believe will be condemned. I will tell you the word baptize in the Greek is baptismo. If you read the, the complete Jewish translation, uh, the, 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 be baptized in the name of the Father, Holy Son, and the Holy Spirit, it's to be immersed in all things of 
the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. So when Jesus is telling them in Mark, and he says, uh, and believes and is baptized, it's not just water immersion. Right? I do a Bible study with my sons before, before tonight, and we're talking about baptism of the Holy Spirit. So I explained that, that part to him as well. But remember, when you're going out and you're sharing the gospel to every creature, there's an obligation to make sure that they're baptized, they're immersed in all things of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. And they'll be saved, and he who does not believe will be condemned. And these signs will follow those who believe. I made the point last week, I'm going to continue to make the point, is that first comes the word, then comes the signs. Not the signs may come. Jesus himself says, will follow. If you're in the word, if you're in the word, the signs will follow. They must follow. So what are the signs of those who believe? In my name, Jesus' name, they will cast out demons. They will speak with new tongues. They will take up servant, serpents. And if they drink anything deadly, by no means will hurt them. Now, this is the most applicable to us. They will lay hands on the sick and they will recover. Not they might recover, or maybe they will recover. Like this is legal authority to do this. So what I want to encourage you, as I said before, people are like, well, I don't have the gift of healing. It's not my thing. Well, if Jesus is your thing, then healing is your thing. Because if you're about Jesus, you're about everything Jesus says Jesus is about. And Jesus is about healing. So what I say is, don't passively look at healing as a gift. I want you to intentionally declare as, it, as your legal right to lay hands on the sick and they will recover. A lot of this is about faith. It's about getting us up to the point where we believe in faith that when we lay hands, they will recover. And I want to encourage you. It doesn't come from emotionality. It's exousia. We talked about that in the Greek. That is your legal authority, your jurisdiction, your commissioning. So, so we do, we tend to look at healing as a gift. I don't have the gift. You have the authority. You have to declare that authority, the legal authority to do what Jesus has sent you to do. I really want to put that challenge on you. We have to be known as a healing body. Not just a healed body, but a body that's willing. Individuals that are willing and able because we have the legal authority and the equipping to minister healing. Otherwise, what good are we? What good are we? I mean, it's like jumping in a fancy truck with four-wheel drive and tires. Well, I can't take that in the mud. It's going to get stuck. Then what good are you? What good are you? And I will challenge you. I believe a lot of this weak Western Christianity is just show. It's just show. We're called to do what Jesus did. So let me jump into this. So John 9, 1. Now as Jesus passed by, he saw a man who was blind from birth. And his disciples asked him, saying, Rabbi, who sinned? This man or his parents? That he was born blind. What I want, to show, I want you to look at right off the bat. Where's the heart of compassion from these disciples? Here's a man, obviously, a beggar. He was born blind. Like, like, the world's always looking for who to blame. Always looking who to blame. Like, whose fault is it that he's blind? It's his mom and dad's fault because, because they sinned, or it's his fault? Like, where's the compassion? Before Jesus did anything, it came from a heart of compassion for the Father. That's why we say healing, deliverance, prophecy, the gifts. It can't, it's not a production. It's not a performance. It's got to come from compassion, the compassion, the heart of the Father. But you see, even his disciples at this point, in their close relationship with Jesus, they've witnessed healings, and they still don't fully understand the miraculous manifestation of physical healing. What I want to say is, let this apply to you. Like, don't beat yourselves up if you're kind of struggling about the reality of healing. 
Like I've seen it, I see on TV, but I've never actually tried. Because I don't know. I've shared with you guys before, the, the pastor that we had for a short period of time, he was honest, wasn't wise. He was honest and he said, don't ask me to go to the hospital and pray for nobody sick. Because what if it doesn't work? What am I going to look like? I'm like, well, you look like the guy that we're never going to come back to his church. Don't be that person. It's not about you. It's not about you. If Jesus has your commission to do it and you have the authority to do it, then you've got to have the faith to do it. And you've got to put your hands on some folks and they will, they will recover. But you've got to understand your authority. But what I want to encourage is if like the disciples, they didn't fully understand. This is what equipping is. This is what equipping is. It is coming. It is learning. It is applying. So don't give up. Don't give up. If you don't understand, continue to be um, equipped, continue to ask, continue to be discipled. I'm telling you, earlier in the year, the Lord showed me that vision of this wall. And it's filled with wheelchairs and crutches and, and medications that are no longer needed. That is to be our testimony wall. So John 9, 3. Jesus answered, Neither this man nor his parents sin, but that the works of God should be revealed in him. You see what Jesus does? He flips the script. He reframes the situation by not throwing blame, by teaching that the man's blindness was not an issue of fault, but an opportunity for God's power to be displayed. You see, that's where the compassionate heart of the Father comes from. Maybe someone with a, with a drug addiction or a pornography addiction or, or, or some other affliction. And, and, and the, you know, the lukewarm believers want to be, well, well, why are you doing that? They want to cast judgment instead of, instead of condemnation. We need, to, we need to start with compassion. We need to understand our legal authority. So what Jesus is doing is he's teaching what I want you to understand is as you're ministering, you're teaching. As you minister, you teach. And that's the beauty of discipleship. We're all called to make disciples. Whether you're meeting one-on-one -on -one with people or whether you're in the process of ministering healing or deliverance, you're teaching so they understand. You know, actually, when you're explaining what you're doing and why you're doing it, it helps those people. It also helps you understand the process. And really, a lot of what it does, it removes any fears of mysticism. If somebody walks up with, with say, a, you know, say, a bunion, I'm going to stick with that example. It's a dumb example, but a bunion on their foot, and, and all of a sudden, we're, we're speaking in tongues, and we're throwing oil, and hey, there's just this sense of mysticism. And it takes away from the glory of God. The production overrides the actual the product of faith being manufactured. So, when you're ministering, take the time to teach and explain what you're doing. Uh, if we solely focus on showing God through faith, that person, and also us and other people around, we're, being, we're giving them an opportunity to move closer. Either growing in their faith, or we're planting seeds for them to come into faith. Everything we do when we minister to people, healing, we're, we're going to focus on. Um, every time we minister healing... It is to grow the faith of the person, the people, and yourself. So I really do. I want to challenge you to not shy away from those opportunities, to, to press into healing ministry, to learn healing ministry, and to receive healing as a part of ministry. So we'll go on. We'll say John 9, 6. When he has said these things, he spat on the ground and made clay with the saliva. And he anointed the eyes of the blind man with the clay. So again, I want to go back to Jesus is teaching as he heals. The healing, the deliverance, prophecy, the gifts. It's all for edification of the body. Not satisf satisfaction of ourselves. Now, is there, is, there, is there edification in seeing the Holy Spirit's gifts manifested in us? Yeah. It is a blessing to be used as a vessel for God. It truly is. But it's all about bringing glory to God. It's all about edifying the body. So Jesus, what he's doing is when he takes the clay, let me ask, could Jesus have healed his vision without, without spitting on some mud? Could he have done it? He could have. 
But what he's doing as he's teaching is that he's actually, he's applying Scripture in his actions. I always tell people the gospel is more caught than taught. People are watching you. People are watching you. And they're going to either be drawn to, people will travel for miles to watch you burn for Jesus. They'll also check in on social media to see a dumpster fire. That flame is up to you. What do you want to burn in your life? I challenge you to burn for Jesus. Let the holy refining fire burn upon the altar of your life. So when you're ministering to people, use things, a symbolic gestures, symbolic items. And I'm going to talk more about that. I don't want it to sound weird. I want to teach you the power in healing. So Jesus could have done it without mud. But you know what he's doing? He's going back to Genesis 2-7. He's connecting Old Testament to his current situation. It says, and the Lord God formed man from what? From dust, from dirt, from clay of the ground. And he breathed into his nostrils the breath of life. And the man became a living being. The man became new, restored, living his full life. This brother being healed became new and restored and moved into living his full life. I want to share with you when you're, when you're ministering, like don't get so locked in to, to what, oh, I don't remember what to say. I don't remember what to do. Remember that you're, that you're teaching and you're impressing upon the person you're ministering to as well as other people the power of God. So I'm going to explain it just a little bit. I don't want to jump ahead of myself, but this is what Jesus does with the mud. I don't want to think, and I know in the Hebrew culture back then, they thought that saliva had some mystical healing power. I think it's just gross. Um, I don't know that there's any mystical healing power, but what Jesus was doing was he was going back to the Old Testament. He was going back to creation using a symbolic act as part of the gesture in the mud. So just so we know, and I know we do, but there was, Jesus could have done it out without the mud in the spit. So the important thing, like I said, what it's doing is he's attaching that act of healing back to the act of creation, just through the use of that, through that mud. Uh, what it also will do when Jesus is doing this, it, it helps you to reinforce your believer's authority that's given to you by God. You see, we always should go back to scripture, whether it's whether it's uh, the Great Commission or whether it's creation, when you're ministering, when you're ministering healing, always go back to Scripture. This is what gives you the authority, is the Word of the Lord. This is what means the signs will follow, is the Word of the Lord. Sometimes I've watched people minister, and they never even mention Jesus' name. They never mention the blood of the Lamb. They totally forget about Scripture. And, and I'll, I, I'm going to call him out. I saw you last Sunday. I think you pulled your phone out. And I'm, I know there was Scripture on it. And you were applying as you were ministering to somebody. And, and this is what I'm encouraging you to do. Don't get wrapped up in, well, I don't remember anything or I forgot it. We cannot move into ministry absent the Word of the Lord. Get you some scripture that is applicable to the ministry that you're moving into. If you have to, just to make sure, go through. The Holy Spirit will tell you, you got 10, this is what that brother needs to hear. Don't, don't come into production like, well, I've got to remember and quote scripture. You'd be better off pumping the brakes, pulling out your phone. Remember what Moses said before we go into the promised land. I want you to commit these to memory. So they had phylacteries. Remember, that was the box that they attached to their arm and to their head. It was so important that they remember the word of the Lord. I told you today, you've got, a, you've got a digital phylactery. It is a digital box that has the word of the Lord in it. Don't neglect it. It's there for a purpose. So stay impractical. What Jesus did in that situation, he used what he had available. What he had available was mud. And the mud, it says, to anoint the man's eyes. Now, I will tell you, in the Greek, um, to anoint, it's mashash, and it simply means to smear or rub with oil. That's what anoint means uh, in the Hebrew. So what Jesus is doing, he's using what he had, 
be it your cell phone. We have oil on the, on the, uh, on the platform for ministry. But he's using physical elements in his teaching to convey a deeper spiritual truth and to engage the faith and understanding of those people around him. Like, do you think they got interested when they saw this Messiah reach down and pick up a hand of mud? Like, what's the deal? Do you think they got really interested when he hocked a loogie and dropped it into his palm full of spit? You got my attention. You also got my gag reflex, but you got my attention. Do you think they were pulled deeper into what Jesus was doing when they saw him begin to rub it in? Do you think they really started getting curious when they're like, no, he ain't going to. Oh, what Jesus is doing is engaging the crowd. He's engaging the attention by using the elements around him. When you're focused on Christ, when you're focused on the cross, what's important is the word, is the scripture, not what they're anointed with. We keep this oil up here because scripture says anoint with oil. Matter of fact, James 5, 14, uh, 15 tells us because oil is commonly used in scripture. It is, a, it is a symbolic act. It is a symbolic substance to anoint, to rub with oil. James 5, 14, 15 tells us, is anyone among you sick? Let him call for the elders of the church and let them pray over him, anointing him with oil in the name of the Lord. Remember, in the Hebrew, anointing means to smear, to rub in. And the prayer of faith will save the sick and the Lord will raise him up and if he has committed sins, he will be forgiven. Now, what I will tell you, I just want to make this note. When, when we see Jesus forgiving people uh, before resurrection, before the indwelling of the Holy Spirit, when Jesus would say, your sins are forgiven. But, but this James is written post-crucifixion, post-resurrection, post-indwelling of the Holy Spirit. So by our, we confess our sins, we're forgiven. The elders are not forgiving you of your sins. It is the indwelling Holy Spirit, the 100% righteousness of God through the Holy Spirit living in you when you receive salvation that justifies you and forgives you of your sin. This is the difference between healing and Jesus saying your sins are forgiven and post-resurrection uh, day of Pentecost. Just so I know you understand that. I just want to make it clear. So, um, let me see. I want to be a good steward of time. Let me jump down. So when we talk about James 5, 15, it says the Lord will raise him up. In the Greek, the word is, um, I'm not even going to try to say it, but to raise up means to excite, to arouse, to awaken. When Jesus raised someone from the dead, he excited them. He aroused them. When James says, if you're sick, you call for the elders, they'll anoint you with oil, the prayer of faith, you will be raised up. That is with excitement. That is with excitement to be raised up, to be lifted up. This is the way we should approach healing ministry. We should come with an expectation and an anticipation of them being raised up. The glory of God being manifested in their life. Because we've, we've probably seen some people do a ministry and, and they're like, oh my gosh, where's the fruits of the Spirit? I don't see any joy and you're the minister. We should approach this with an expectation and an anticipation of the glory of God. We know that we've been given legal authority to, through faith, through ministry, through our exousia, through faith to heal, to raise up. John 9, 7 and he said to him, go wash in the pool of Siloam, which is translated sent. So he went and washed and came back seen. You see, remember what Jesus, we said, the healing is therapy. and the Greek is therapo. It's working with someone. Jesus didn't wave a magic wand to heal anybody. He met with, he talked to, he ministered to. Healing is an act of therapy, therapo, therapy. So what part of that is, when you go to a physical therapist, if you've ever gone through therapy, is he'll ask you to do something. Let me check your range of motion. He's giving you an assignment. What does Jesus do with this man? He, is, he has delivered ministry, and he, and he anointed him, and he says, go. He's given him a task. This task is to activate his faith 
in the healing process. I encouraged you last week, and I encourage you today, when you're ministering healing to someone, have a good understanding, an accurate understanding of what they're asking for. Make sure that that first we're we're ministering to the spiritual nature, the soul care of the individual. But if it's a a physical uh, injury uh, and you, you minister healing, don't be afraid to give them an assignment, to give them a task. Let them put their faith into action. Most people who come for physical healing do not realize. They don't know what they're supposed to do. They're coming to you to lead them into this process. Teach them, guide them. Just like Jesus, go wash in the pool of Shalom. Go. He's given them an opportunity to put his faith into action. You know, and I looked up some data in physical therapy, in natural physical therapy of the body, people who enter into rehab immediately versus those who either don't finish rehab or don't go to rehab, with, it's, called a, it's called flexion. So the people who go to rehab immediately, say with a knee injury, right, you will, get, you will gain an advantage of 40 degrees of flexion. So you say, well, what does that mean? Well, what it means is going into rehab, going into therapy, working with a therapist throughout the duration, it means you'll gain 40 degrees of flexion. And in in what it means to the person in rehab, it's the difference between jogging and hobbling for the rest of their life. Why? Because you've gone through a process of rehabilitation through therapo, through therapy. So through all throughout the New Testament, I think 95% of the time or 93% of the time, in the Greek, when, when they talk about healing, they're talking about therapo. They're talking about therapy. They're talking about working. We told you that we're, we're, the, we're the guy with the withered arm, which is like, reach out your arm and be healed. It took an act, an activation of that faith. Don't hesitate to put someone into into a situation where they can activate their faith. You know, I actually thought about it as I was preparing the message. Like, what if if you had the opportunity to put faith into action? What if you were Jesus in Mark 5, 41? What if you got the chance to say, Talitha Kumai? Can you imagine having that opportunity as you're ministering healing over someone to be able to put that faith in action? Talitha Kumai. Little girl, I say to you, arise, arise. But if we don't know to give a command to put the faith in action, we miss the opportunity. The person may may continue to linger in a state. So the next question that I wanted to pose is, how did a blind man with spit and mud in his eyes, how did he find that pool? He didn't say anybody. He said, go. How did the guy know where to find the pool? You know how? Any way he had to. How'd those old boys get that that paralytic in front of Jesus last week? They ripped the roof. Any way he had to. I want to tell you that there's really nothing neat or tidy or even dignified about ministry. I know we all want to put on the old, you know, Is it Adrian Rogers with the nice suit? And we all want to have a microphone on our... But that's not the reality of ministry. That's sharing a gospel message. But when it gets down to where where it's, it's... Are you willing to make your way through the city in front of your peers and your family and your friends with mud smeared on your face? Are you willing to find this pool in faith Are you willing to tenaciously pursue your full and complete healing? I just want to encourage you. Discipleship is messy. Look how many times Jesus had to correct them old boys. Healing, ministry, it gets undignified. If you want healing, you declare healing. You don't release the promise of healing until you've realized the full manifestation of healing. I just want to ask you, I want to encourage you. Think about your own life. Maybe symbolically at the lowest point or reality uh, lowest point. And somebody, somebody put spit and mud in your face. We would think it as insulting. What's more important at this point? Your healing or your pride? When you come up to receive healing, 
I ask you, repent, confess, come as a clean vessel, willing to be received, to receive healing. When you're ministering healing, don't just jump up here. Make sure that there's nothing keeping you from, from being usable by God. Make sure that you repent, that you confess. Make sure that your heart has been circumcised of anything that keeps you away from God. And in any way, anything we do, worship, anything, but this is healing ministry, you see. And then the important thing I want you to understand is it's a partnership. You and God, you partner in that moment of healing. Whether you're the one ministering healing or you're the one receiving healing, there's a partnership. Apart from the Holy Spirit, like I said, you're just like Sceva's seven sons. You're out there trying to do deliverance ministry, and you're saying, well, in the name of Jesus, the God that Paul professes, mm -mm. apart from the blood of the Lamb, apart from the exousia, the indwelling of the Holy Spirit, you're out there on a limb putting yourself and other people at risk. Make sure it is a partnership between you and the Holy Spirit. So John 9, 7, so he went and washed and came back seeing. You see, the recipient must be part of the process. And when they're given the opportunity to, re to receive healing by faith, they've got to be willing to give it a shot. But you, the minister, the teacher, you've got to lead them through it. Because the truth is, most people don't know how to receive healing. Most believers, true believers that are willing to minister healing, don't really understand healing. I'll tell you the truth, a lot of churches won't touch it. They won't even talk about it. Not from the platform. I'm not saying we're anything special. We're just obedient. Because we believe if Jesus says it, we can do it. So I want to encourage you when you're ministering to people, don't just assume that they understand what's going on. Take the time to teach them, to lead them. It is your job to mentor them as their spiritual therapist. Part of that therapist is to work with them and work them through the process and giving them an action of faith. And I know it doesn't sound like, ooh, that's fun. It's work. It's work. It is work. But it is worth it. So I want to jump down. I've got some things on the board. These are actually like some practical tips, I guess, uh, based on John 9 uh, when we're ministering uh, healing. If you can pop down to um, it's slide 17. So these are just some of the things I, I just, we know it intuitively, but it's always important to articulate it, especially because this is an equipping session, but always recognizing that God is the source of healing. You say, yeah, no joke. Well, seriously, obviously, we know that some people don't realize that. They get caught up in their gift. They get caught up in their anointing. They get caught up in the production. And then they find themselves ineffective. If we start our ministry or we even start to come for healing with the understanding that God is the source, we're already a step ahead. Prepare spiritually. The folks that are, that are volunteered, they're scheduled to serve in, in altar ministry, like come prayed up. Come prayed up. Don't just hop up here and think because you're standing in a location or, or you meet somebody at Kroger and you go prayed up wherever you go. Kurt and I and we, Joe, we've always talked about be prepared in every season, in all seasons. Be spiritually prepared. And this is what I was talking about. Use symbolic acts if you're led by the Holy Spirit. Uh, a symbolic act is like anointing with oil or laying hands on somebody. And it can be powerful. Uh, I've got some examples in the next slide of what symbolic acts are. And, and things like laying on of hands. There is a transference of power by the laying on of hands. It was established in the Old Testament, and it continues today. There is a power that is transferred by the laying on of hands. Now, I will tell you this, and I used to warn everybody in the beginning of the year, and, and uh, him had asked, uh, reminded me about it a couple of weeks ago, because there is a transference, there is a supernatural spiritual transference by the laying on of hands, you be careful who you let lay their hands on you. You be careful who you let lay their hands on you. And there is nothing wrong with saying, no thanks. No thanks. Like, this is nothing to play with. You really have got to be careful who you allow to lay hands on you, to pray over you. So, um, the other one was anointing with oil. That's got Old Testament uh, use of water, symbolic of cleansing, and speaking in tongues. 
that is associated with the presence of the Holy Spirit. So if there's an opportunity to use symbolic acts, um, take those opportunities if you're led by the Holy Spirit. Not as an act of production, but if you're led by the Holy Spirit. So some of the other um, aspects of of doing ministry, um, we go to the next, it's pray with authority. Like if you're not sure, like what do you want them to do? And I don't mean yell and scream, but make declarations, healing in the name of Jesus. Healing in the name of Jesus. There is power in the name of Jesus. Pray with authority. Encourage obedience. You know, we, we talk about with, uh, with deliverance ministry. You know, we know, what, we know what the Bible says. If you cast them out and then the house is empty, he'll come back with seven demons more wicked than before. Now you've got bigger problems. You'd be better off not even delivering that person. Let them deal with the one because the eight are wicked. So what we've got to do as part of our encouraging uh, obedience is to, is to move people into taking steps in their life to forgive people, to change their lifestyle, or different acts of obedience. Reading the Word, Romans 12 too. Those things are important. Seek spiritual cleansing. This was, a, this was a prophetic act that Jesus told him to go and wash, but it's also a symbol of spiritual cleansing. Things such as confession and repentance and prayer. These are the things that keep your heart and your mind aligned with God. Monday night, I was meeting with one of the men that, that I meet with in discipleship, and he was like, well, we're already, we're already forgiven of our sins. Like, why do, He was asking theoretically, just for a better understanding. Um, but he said, like, well, why do we have to confess our sins? We've already been forgiven of our sins. Well, you are. But it's the confession that, that keeps your heart in alignment with God. Like I said, do you always have to apologize to your spouse? No. But if you keep making the same mistakes without an apology, what happens to the relationship? It gets strained. It starts to struggle. It's the same thing. Repenting, confessing to the Lord keeps your heart clear, keeps you available to to minister. And then to wrap it up, provide support and follow up. Unless you're ministering at a big Billy Graham revival, most of the time when we're offering, when we're healing um, and delivering ministry, we know the people, there's proximity, but continue to pray and encourage people. Just, it's not a one and done. Like I said, you become their spiritual therapist. Maintaining a relationship with God. I am talking about going deeper into your relationship. I do. I want to see every one of us laying hands and healing the sick. Because Jesus says we can and Jesus said we will. But your faith and your obedience has to say that I will. You have to receive the mantle. That only going to come by maintaining your relationship with God. And then I want to wrap up with sharing stories of healing to build faith. Revelations tells us that, that the devil's overcome by the blood of the Lamb and, the, and the, the power of our testimonies. There is nothing like someone who has, who has defeated cancer by the blood of the Lamb or who has been healed, who has been restored to share those stories and build faith. I encourage you to share those stories, to share the faith. So if we can stand and and let me pray over this, let me pray over this message. And then what I would do, uh, I don't know if Ellie's still here or maybe she's running. But if if you want to come up, Ellie, I'll I'll make that offer. But but after I pray, if we can come up, uh, I would invite whoever wants to come up to the altar to to, to serve as as ministry leaders and, and pray for healing. I don't want to miss this opportunity. Uh, not just physical healing, if there's an issue, a, a spiritual nature. But, uh, but I do. This is equipping. This is the time to be bold. This is the time to be bold. So, Lord, Father, we thank you, Lord. We praise you. We thank you for these opportunities to, to come. And, and we always say these, are, these Wednesday nights are equipping nights. This is where we come to, to, to just to sharpen our aim, to get on target, to become better at serving others, to be equipped. So, Lord, I thank you for the body that's here, Lord. I thank you for the families that are represented. I thank you for the the generational legacies that are established by the effort, by the equipping, by the obedience. Lord, we thank you for commissioning us with the legal authority to heal I pray that that the body takes this charge, this legal commissioning, 
this apostolic calling to go and do, to look for tangible opportunities to minister healing to the body, to look for tangible opportunities to minister healing to the lost. To go out with an anticipation of an encounter with you, Lord, through the ministerial act of healing. Lord, I, I, I received the vision that you gave earlier in the year of that wall filled with evidence of healing. I received that. I declare that. I loose that over this body. I charge you with the responsibility of ministering those healings. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Thank you, Lord.